I want to encourage you today. God doesn't cause evil to happen, but he does use all situations of our life to bring good and to do good through our lives and to the world. You know, the reason that Jesus came is he came to bring us life abundantly. And that great life-flowing spirit that he pours into our spirit is the reality of what he wants for us. And yet we all know that we do live in a fallen world. We live in a broken world. We live in a world where there is still death, where there is still such a thing as pandemics, where still things happen to us that are negative and difficult. In Christ, however, that is not the final word. Through Christ and through living with him and partnering with him, even in suffering and difficult situations, we can see the light of his glory breaking through and great things happening for his glory. So what are the steps to overcoming suffering? Well, the first is to be willing to allow ourselves to grieve and to grieve deeply. In my cultural tradition, we have a thing where people shouldn't grieve. You know, when someone passes away, we say of them, oh, they did so well when they showed no emotion at a funeral when they lost a loved one. But that is not a biblical model. The biblical model it enables us and it speaks to us and it validates our grief. It validates when we pour out our pain and pour out our emotion and weep and cry and fully let vent to the pain that we suffer. Not all tears are evil. God has created us as emotional beings so that we can weep and mourn when we suffer and when we go through times of great, great personal pain. It's okay to grieve. I learned this from a situation where Susie and I, my wife and I, I introduced you to her a little earlier. We went through a terrible pain in our lives of miscarriage. I introduced you to Levi, Elisa and Gabrielle Joy. Now, in between each child, we had a miscarriage. And this was the most pain that we had suffered as a married couple in our lives overall. The first miscarriage we had was, I was on a ministry. I was preaching in the Caribbean and St. Croix on the Virgin Islands. And when I arrived there, Susie called me and said, Paul, something's going on here. I don't know what's going on, but but I'm starting to bleed. I I don't know what's happening to my child that I'm carrying. I said to Susie, I'm, I'm, I'll jump on the next flight back. She said, no, you need to do what God has spoken for you to do and carry out your ministry fully. I was so heartbroken. My heart was searing like a hot razor blade was cutting. Hot tears of pain sprang to my eyes. How could I be losing this little child, the one that we had embraced, the one that already had such a, a, a part in our lives. For us, it wasn't just a fetus. This was a child that God had given to us. And we were looking forward with such great joy to meeting him. And there was such pain. Lord, how could this be happening? Then we had Elisa and joy came back to our lives. But then the second miscarriage happening. In fact, it was a very um, busy day and Susie came out of the bathroom and said, Paul, it's happening again. I remember driving down the road feeling like, Lord, how can this be happening again? How can we have already had a beautiful child and now we're losing yet another, another beautiful baby? Again, this, this pain just seared my heart. 
By the time I had gotten up to the, um, the hospital, Susie had already had an ultrasound. And the doctor said to her, we're very sorry. There is no more heartbeat. We wept and grieved and we fell into one another's arms. And yet we celebrated this life that God had given to us only for a brief time and yet had now passed away. Then we had Gabrielle Joy. What a joy and a delight. And then we had our third miscarriage. I remember sitting outside the doctor's office and just weeping. There was no more heartbeat. We had lost our third child. It was a terrible situation. We were moving. I put Susie in a hotel so that she could rest. She was in such pain and agony and literally on her hands and knees, walking up and down. She was in such pain. And then we had to move our house that day. When I got to the hotel room, she said, I didn't want to tell you, but I'm in such pain. And I comforted her as she lost the baby. Lord, how can this be happening again? It was such a time of overwhelming grief in our own hearts and in our own lives. We had so many questions. How could it have happened in this pattern? Why, could, why did we lose a child, each other beautiful child, that we, healthy child that we had brought forward? You know, when we go through suffering, there's often no answers to our questions. There's often no easy, trite, pat answers. And it's a time for grief. There is a time for everything. There is a time to mourn, it says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And it's important that we open our hearts and allow us to grieve. So whatever suffering and loss that you have encountered, allow yourself to grieve. Surround yourself with people who would just be there. Not like Job's friends trying to give an answer, trying to defend even God. It's a time for grief. Now, listen to me. By saying biblically that there is a time for grief, we're also saying that there is a boundary to that grief. Ungodly grief is a grief that has no boundaries. But godly grief says to mourn and to allow yourself to fully grieve, but to find wholeness on the end of that grief. Ungodly grief leads people into abandoning their faith in God. And that's not the grief that we are talking about. The kind of grief we are talking about enable you to fully process this pain and suffering. But on the other end of this pain and suffering, healing comes, strengthening comes. And friends, there is nothing and no pain and no suffering that has impacted you that there is not healing for. God wants to fully heal you of your pain because he came to give us life on the other side of pain eternal life and filling with the Holy Spirit. Secondly, how do we overcome pain and overcome suffering? It's when we no longer look at ourselves and look at our own pain, but God gives us a perspective to help other people. What does this look like? Well, my wife and I, when we went through our third miscarriage, a supporting church of us, a missionary supporting church, heard of what had happened. And they sent us up to a hotel so that we would be able to mourn and grieve just together with no considerations of taking care of our other kids. And it was such a blessing to be able to have that experience. And as we were grieving, we were also processing. At that time, the Lord had challenged Susie previously to go to northern Nigeria to help the persecuted suffering church, the church where thousands of people have been martyred for their witness for Jesus. And so Susie, the Lord had told us, 
that we should send her to go and serve these people. But now Susie was having a miscarriage. Surely she shouldn't go. I mean, her body hadn't even healed yet. And the Lord said to us these words, my children, I know that you're suffering, but I want you to look away from your own suffering and look to others and serve them in their pain. That's what Jesus did. And Philippians chapter two, it said, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So that's what we did. We said, yes, Lord, we'll send Susie. A couple of weeks later, and Susie was still experiencing physical pain and the physical impacts of her miscarriage. She went to North Nigeria into a war zone. And friends, it was touch and go. However, God knows how to look after us as we are following him in his will. So she gets to the middle of this war zone. The governor of this whole region hears that she is coming with an international team. And he calls them and said, it's too dangerous for this team to stay at a local hotel. And he invited her and the whole team to not only stay in the governor's mansion, but the governor's palace. Susie said she had never stayed in such a beautiful accommodation. God knows how to look after his daughter. God knows how to look after us who were walking due to his will. She was also given a group of 10 soldiers with automatic weapons to protect her so that she wouldn't be, um, she wouldn't be um, suffering or she wouldn't suffer an impact due to fighters finding out who she was and wanting to abduct her or kill her. But Susie said to the governor, she said, thank you so much for your generosity, but I can't, I can't do this. I can't minister to people with soldiers standing around with, with machine guns. And so she let them go and just went out to minister and share the gospel with these people. Now, my wife is a photographer missionary. And so she takes photos and ministers deeply to the people that she is engaging with. She went to a village who had lost 501 people in one night to extremist fighters who hacked them to death through machetes. And she met a woman called Paulina Monti, who herself had been um, cut and hacked by these extremists. They cut her head, they mutilated her hands so that she would not be able to take care of her kids. Um, she fell unconscious as they were cutting her down. When she woke up, she was telling Susie the story. She said, she asked immediately, what about my children? And you know what that evening she had lost three children had been killed by these fighters. When Susie heard this, she said to Paulina Monte, I too have lost three children. And these two women fell into one another's arms. She said, I lost three children to miscarriage. My circumstances are so much more different than yours, but I've lost these three children too. And the two women fell into one another's arms and wept. And you know what? God started healing the heart of my wife. My wife found healing, not from looking at her own pain, but looking out and to minister other people in their pain. And through that, she found healing. Another way that we can overcome suffering in our lives is by looking out to others, not allowing that to be an end in and of itself, but through the pain that we would minister to others and God is faithful and he will heal our own hearts. Through this, God not only um, healed my wife's heart and blessed so many people, but you know what happened? We started a whole ministry. We were able to take care of 6,000 widows who had lost their husband due to them uh, losing their lives because of their faith in Jesus. We were also able to rebuild 16 churches. I would love to see every church that the fighters have blown up and destroyed, where there is a Christian community still there. I'd love to see each one rebuilt. It's around about 4,000 churches, but we could do that. But we have done 16 so far, so God is good. We're also now building the largest campus in YWAM 
to take care of these widows and their families, of our brothers and sisters who have lost their lives because of their faith in the Lord Jesus. God did so much through my wife's willingness, not only to look at her own pain, but to also minister to others in their pain. Thirdly, our suffering can lead us to seeing God. Job is an amazing story of a man who had lost it all. He lost his, his children. He lost his businesses. He lost everything. He lost the respect of his wife. And he was in deep pain. And you know, his friends came and said to him, you know, this happened to you because you did something wrong. He said, absolutely not. I have not done anything wrong. I don't know what's going on, but I am blameless. And you know, his friends started defending God. See, God wouldn't allow this to happen to you unless you would have done something really bad. And he said, no, absolutely not. Are you going to lie to defend God? Anyway, there was chapter after chapter of questions. But Job, he remained in relationship with God. And friends, that's what we have to do. Allow no suffering in your life to take you away from faith in the Lord Jesus. Don't allow um, self-focus and ungodly grief to lead you away. Find a godly boundary to your grief. And God will take you by the hand and you will see God. After such a long time of um, supporting the suffering church in North Nigeria, the local believers there, uh, they said to me, you know, Paul, now it's time for you to come. It's a long story. Maybe I can tell it to you at another time in full. But I went to a very dangerous place. They didn't need to tell me it was dangerous. I saw the effects of war, big holes in the ground where there had been big tank battles only several weeks before. And I went up to our brothers and sisters. And folks, they asked me to teach on the revelation of Jesus Christ, the last book of the Bible. With delight I did because I had learned the book by heart. I had taught it many times. But, you know, I never really understood the book until I taught it to those people. Everything became clear. It became all about how amazing Jesus was. There I was. And frankly, I was fearing for my life. But when we got to Revelation chapter 5, it shows us how great Jesus is. That he is worthy of it all. He's not worthy because we say and we ascribe value and worth to him. You know, he is worthy in and of himself. And all of a sudden, I realized that he was worthy of my whole life. He is worthy of it. And I said to him gratefully, I surrender my life to you, Lord Jesus. You are worthy of it all. And all of a sudden, this warmth of the presence of Christ just swept over me. And Jesus came into every, into that little church and touched every single person. I taught for three hours straight and his gentle, life-giving spirit went around the whole room and touched every person that was there. Through our suffering, we see God. And he fills our lives and our hearts up with his joy and his glory and his peace and his graciousness. He truly is a good God. So three simple steps, but effective, of being able to overcome suffering in our lives. Grieve, but grieve in a godly way. Find a godly boundary to your grief. Secondly, don't only look at yourself. Look to minister to others, even in your grief, and you will find great healing. Thirdly, hold on to Jesus. And as you hold on to Jesus through suffering, you will see God.